Mark, I saw something. I think that face that you're going to do at Facebook. That I think you made an announcement that um, you're not going to have any meetings of of more than uh, a certain number of people until 2021. Is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So as part of the staggered reopening of society, it's it's not just going to be that some locations open before others. It's going to need to be that um, you know some functions and and some jobs can get done, and others. Uh, we just wait longer to bring back online. And I think large events are probably going to be the last thing, or at least one of the last things that comes back online. So we've gone ahead and made the policy call now um, that through June of 2021, uh, so uh, next year, uh, we're not going to uh, uh, we're not going to host any internal or external physical events that have 50 or more people in them. Hmm. Um, a lot of the events that we need to hold will just shift to be virtual online events. Um, but some of them, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find other ways to do them or we'll just cancel them. Uh, but I think that, that doesn't mean that we won't be productive until then. Uh, but I do think that large events, you know, people going to sports events, uh, movie theaters, things like that are probably going to be uh, one of the last things that, that comes online as part of this reopening. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious, when, when you think about um, uh, providing accurate knowledge to, to people or helping do that, or at least not letting them get um, bad knowledge, this, this is a story where we've learned a lot along the way. I mean, the knowledge has sort of changed, uh, you know, we, we, how, just how communicable it is, uh, how lethal it is, how it's spreading, should you wear masks, should you not wear masks, uh, all these types of things. When there's a lot of information out there, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of bad information as well. How, just how do, you, how do you approach thinking about that to make sure that the, the right knowledge, at least what we know at the time, is what's getting out there? Yeah, so I think one of the most important functions that Facebook and, and our apps can do right now is help connect people with authoritative health information and experts, um, and at the same time to limit the spread of misinformation. So on the work that we're doing to uh, connect people with authoritative health information, um, we've actually directed more than 2 billion people um, to this COVID-19 information center uh, that we built, that we put at the top of the Facebook app for everyone. Um, and uh, through these educational pop-ups that we've put throughout the product. If you go search for information or, or if you show up in a group, for example. Um, and of the 2 billion people that we've shown that to, mm. more than 350 million people have clicked through and, um, and spent some time on the, on the COVID information center. So that is, is valuable. It's showing information from health experts, um, from local government officials. Uh, it's, it's just it's high quality content. Um, Equally important is making sure that we limit the spread of misinformation. And there, uh, th there are two basic policies that we have. One is um, if information, if someone's spreading something that puts people at imminent risk of physical harm, then we take that down. We don't allow that on Facebook um, at all. So, you know, for example, some people are trying to spread these complete hoaxes, like, um, you know, if you uh, want to cure coronavirus, um, drink bleach, right? Obviously that's, that's a disaster, that's false and that's dangerous. So you know, if someone tries to share that, we'll just take that down. And, um, and there have been a lot of pieces of content like that that we've taken down. Um, there are also other misinformation that may not lead to physical, I I imminent risk of physical harm, uh, but still isn't the type of stuff we wanna be spreading through our system. And there we work with independent fact checkers. Um, and so far during this crisis, uh, those fact checkers have, have marked 4,000 pieces of content, um, individual articles false, which has led to us showing uh, warning labels to uh, more than 40 million times across our products when people come across something that's false. And the warning labels work. Now, we know that because 95% of the time um, when someone sees a piece of information um, that, that has a fact check on it, uh, they don't go through and consume that information. So mm. I think that overall, both of these sides of the equation, the showing authoritative information um, and limiting the spread of misinformation um, are incredibly important, especially so during a health crisis. And, um, and you know, a lot of work has gone into this. We've gotten yeah. a lot better at this over the last few years as a company, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of the way that the team is, is working on this. You're also working on, on building disease prevention maps. And, and can you just explain, using all the data that you have access to, can you, can you explain how that works and, and, and the, what it might be able to show and help people with? Sure, I think that this is gonna be potentially a very important tool for, uh, for governments and, and public health officials. So what we're doing is we're, we're running 
a widespread survey across Facebook asking people um, what kind of symptoms they're feeling. Do you feel a fever? Do you have a cough, uh, shortness of breath? Have you lost your, your sense of smell? Um, and by asking those questions, and basically we're working with uh, academics uh, at Carnegie Mellon University to start. So, um, so all the information goes to them. We're not collecting health information about people. Um, but through the survey, we're then able to produce a county by county map across the country um, of the prevalence of, of disease and people with symptoms. And I think that this is just gonna be quite valuable um, for local governments uh, and, and health officials to get a sense of what's happening in their area and what's about to happen because people report feeling symptoms um, days before they would actually feel like they need to go get tested or would show up in the hospital or develop um, some of the more severe side effects of, of, of COVID. So this can help give people a leading indicator of what's happening, which can help plan uh, the near-term public health uh, response, help allocate uh, scarce resources, whether it's uh, masks or ventilators. Uh, but then over the coming weeks and months, it'll also help uh, local governments figure out how they should be opening up uh, their uh, when it's going to be safe to, to start opening and, and having people um, come back into society, or if something starts going wrong and there's a recurrence, um, when they might need to re restrict things further again until it gets back under control. And, and Priscilla, through the, the, the Chan Zuckerberg I I initiative, you're also redirecting a lot of efforts to coronavirus. Yeah, so, you know, Mark, the study uh, that Mark's talking about through Facebook is an awesome example of sentinel testing where you get the early signs. But um, also important is the ability for individual patients to know that they actually have coronavirus and if they've been infected with coronavirus in the past. Hmm. And policymakers are also going to want to know how, what's the incidence, how many cases of coronavirus are in my area now? And those are all questions that we're, the scientific community is trying to figure out. But uh, at CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we've been working on science for about four years now um, with the aim of building great infrastructure for scientists so that we can cure, prevent, and manage all disease by the end of the century. Obviously, coronavirus is a awful hit to um, uh, us globally. And so what we've done is actually reoriented a number of resources, including the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, where we invested $600 million for over 10 years for research. And in March, when we realized that testing, um, then the first step being individual testing was necessary, we uh, turned that lab around, equipment, um, leaders, grad students, volunteers, um, faculty members into a, a certified uh, laboratory to test uh, for coronavirus. And within eight days, we got, uh, we got up to a capacity of 1,000 tests a day. Hmm. So that was really um, awesome to be able to serve our community that way. Um, and when we realized that we had more capacity, we've um, now, as of today, made testing free to all departments of public health in California. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. There's um, also an interesting nuance yeah. there um, around, um, because they are a established scientific um, lab in addition to a testing center, they're both testing whether or not an individual has um, coronavirus, and then they're taking the, um, the positives and then doing a full genome sequence of the coronavirus positive test. And they look for tiny mutations in the coronavirus sequence that allows the scientists to sort of back calculate how many other unknown cases there are in a community. And so there's that's just the tip of sort of what these amazing scientists Joe DeRisi, Steve Quake, and others at the Biohub, and then many more across UCSF, Stanford, are trying to, fit, to get to that question that we all need to know, how many cases are there out there so that we can go back to work as a society. Yeah, yeah so yeah. the team over there has done really impressive yeah. work. I mean, it's basically, I mean, we built up all this technology to use for long-term research. And, and like Priscilla said, within days or, or weeks, I mean, basically the team repurposed it and said, hey, yeah, that long-term research is really important, but um, but right now we need to make sure that we can use all this equipment to, to help with testing and, and to help out with the acute response to the health crisis in the Bay Area. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, I've been really proud of them.